Good morning. Thank you for tuning in to Calvary Baptist Church this morning. We're thankful that you're watching. And uh, we want to let our church family know that we're praying for you. And we are encouraged by the, the news that some of you are able to possibly uh, be soon, maybe coming back to church. And uh, we are very thankful for that. And uh, just want to let you know, we always are praying for you. And if you need anything, please let us know. We love you very much. Uh, if you would go ahead and take your Bibles and go to the book of Acts, chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11, uh, just for those of you who have not been able to be at church and are watching online right now, uh, we were away from our study of the book of Acts for quite some time, and last week we picked that back up. And uh, we covered chapter number 10, and so today we're at chapter number 11, and so Acts chapter number 11 is where we find ourselves today. And uh, we're going to be looking at some things that I think that for us as a church we can look at from this church at Antioch and from uh, some things that we see in the life of Barnabas and that we can tie it together and see just what are some things that you and I can do as church members at our church to be effective for Christ. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And so if, if you would, wouldn't mind, we're going to start looking uh, at Acts chapter 11, verse number 19. And it says there, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jew only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were gone, uh, come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came, he had seen the grace of God, and was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for, seek to, uh, for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And uh, what a story that we see here for the book of Acts. Of course, I love the book of Acts because when you read the book of Acts, you're really reading about the history of where the church is headed, where the church is going, and how it really laid the foundations for what we see today and some of the churches that we are in. I wish we were more like uh, the churches back then. I think that they uh, look at their model, look at the way that they operated. Boy, it was a very exciting time. Uh, people were being saved. People were uh, ready to go serve. People were ready to share the gospel. It was a highlight time of all times probably to be part of the church. Of course, back then at that time, there was also persecution that followed church. But We've seen uh, so far in the book of Acts that as persecution comes, the church uh, really does not dwindle down. It's like the persecution is fuel for the fire. And so that's been something that's been interesting to see is that uh, the, the persecution or the trials or the tribulation that's come uh, because of outside forces, the government, because of uh, the, the Sanhedrin, the Jews uh, that did not like Christianity, the, the oppression that came upon them did not drive them away to hide and drove them at maybe out of town but while they went they shared the gospel so it's an amazing story to see that even today as i know that you're you're looking at current current events and it can be an encouragement to you to realize that you know just because things may get more difficult for people uh, from time to time uh, because of their faith and we're seeing that on the rise of, for, for many years that that doesn't necessarily mean that the work of christ comes to an end. It might be just the fuel we need for the fire. And so we were looking at last week, and just to recap really quick, chapter number 10 is all about Peter, who is a Jew, who has followed Christ, who's seen and had his heart start to change about people. Because in his day and time, Jews, they didn't like Samaritans. They were not at all in favor of uh, the Gentiles at all, so that they really had a stigma towards both people and of course we saw his heart start changing towards Samaritans and then we also seen now in chapter number 10 
his heart changed towards the Gentiles. He had this hatred, and they had a hatred back to them. We saw that the Jews really believed that the Gentiles were only good for basically fueling the flames of hell, and how that the Gentiles viewed the Jews as someone who were no better than servants or slaves, or to be squashed like a bug. And so they, they did not get along. But yet, somehow, when Jesus left, he said, I want you to go into all the world. Uh, he said, I want you to start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And they've covered those parts and now into the uttermost parts of the world. And I guess that maybe they thought that the uttermost parts of the world, there must be other Jews somewhere out there. But they, they, they just really were not connecting the dots that God was instructing uh, that now the work is going global. And that means it's going to all people. And so Acts chapter number 10 is that breaking down. Uh, we talked about how that uh, last week there used to be a, uh, a courts that would surround the temple. And each place got you closer to the Holy of Holies. And if you were a Gentile, you were on the outer wall. You couldn't come into the actual temple. You were on the outside. And, and so you could come, but you had to stay on the outside. Well, really what happens in chapter number 10, as what Paul would later say, is that that wall, the partitions, they're all torn down. We all have access to God, Jew, Gentile, Samaritan. Doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your race, your gender, or anything else. We all have access to God. And therefore, we can all come to Christ and through salvation, but we can also pray directly to our Heavenly Father. And so <clears throat> that was one of the things that begins to happen because of what uh, is so we're seeing in chapter 10. Chapter 10, Peter uh, is, sees a vision uh, of all these uh, animals coming down of heaven. And uh, it says that there was clean animals, unclean animals. And uh, as they came down to heaven, uh, God told them to rise and eat. He says, I can't do that, Lord. Uh, there, I have not eaten anything unclean since I've, basically since I've been growing up. I've never done that. And he said that I can't. And uh, God said, don't call what I've called clean, unclean. I, in other words, I, I've made these acceptable now. Uh, your dietary laws that kind of kept you separated from the Gentiles, uh, they, they are now not part of your society or part of your thinking. It doesn't have to be. You can continue to follow those rules. But here's the thing. Uh, we are making way, making uh, room for the Gentiles. And uh, at that same time, there was a knock on the door. And what had happened, there was a man named Cornelius who had sent servants. And he was a Gentile. He was an Italian. He was somebody who was in charge of, uh, of some Roman soldiers. And he was part of the occupational force that Peter would have grown up with. And yet, here it is. These men are, are, are knocking on the door. And he opens the door and invites them in. And uh, what happens, he says, what are you doing here? He says, oh, well, my servant, uh, or my, my master Cornelius has sent us to bring you to him. Because God told him that if you come, you'll be able to tell him the way of salvation. So he hosts him, and that's already a huge deal for Peter, hosting inside his own hall or in the home that he was staying, these Gentiles. And so now here he goes. He, he goes there, and he begins to speak with Cornelius. He comes out and begins to worship him. And he says, hey, I'm just a man just like you. And he says, you know, you and I aren't even supposed to technically be having this conversation, but God has shown me that maybe my heart needs to change, that maybe he is doing some things that I don't understand, and, and maybe I need to just preach this message to you. So he begins to preach. And before he could even finish the message, those that were there, that was part of Cornelius' family and friends, they received the Holy Ghost. That means they got saved. And then he says, well, Peter says, what hinders them from being baptized? And so he, he baptizes them. And, and, and he says, listen, this is, just blows my mind. And, and in the beginning of chapter number 11, what happens is he's actually called back to give an answer for what has happened. The, the, the people that are at the, the, the church in uh, Jerusalem, we're like, wait a second, uh, this isn't the way that's supposed to happen. We we even send people out, but when we do, we send them out to preach to the Jews because he's the he's the coming Messiah. He's not the savior of the Lord, he, world. He's he's our Messiah. And so as as he's brought back, they question him and were very uh, critical of him. And finally, he recounted to them what happened. And he said, listen, I, I was against it too. And yet this is what's happened. This is what Jesus told or God told me. This is what has happened. And, and finally, in verse number 18 of chapter 11, they said, well, we're going to hold our peace because I guess this is true. And they glorified God. So they began to change their hearts. And they say, well, listen, repentance of life is now accepted into the Gentiles. So let's go to the Gentiles.
And so that's where we kind of got the background for those of you who possibly were not here last week about where we're at. So Gentiles now are part of the family. They're being brought in. The Jews now are going to speak to the Gentiles, the people that they hated each other. So now these walls are being broken down. So we come to this place where we see that there was at the time where it kind of backs up in verse number 19 to talk about the history of some of what we've read already in the book of Acts. Persecution came. And it came by way of Saul of Tarsus. And one of the people that were killed, that was killed during this time, uh, was a man named Stephen. And in that, that death of Stephen, up until that time, they had been persecuted, but death was not really on the table. And so now there's been a Christian that's been killed. And of course, Saul was consenting unto this man's death. And it says that when that happens, it says that people begin to scatter, that they begin to leave Jerusalem. They begin to go about and preach the word of God. And they used to preach to the, uh, the story of Jesus, but only to the Jews. Now, this is because they probably, at this point in time, either this event that we've read about in chapter number 10 has not happened, or they've not gotten word of it. So as they're preaching, uh, we come to verse number 20. It says, but there were some people... Uh, who were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, and they came to a place called Antioch. Now, Antioch is not really a great place. As a matter of fact, uh, you begin to look at Antioch, and, and there was about 600,000 people probably there at least. And, and so it was about the third largest uh, city. There, there was Rome, there was Alexandria, and then there was Antioch. It was uh, a place that was famous for its culture, it's famous for uh, its ability to have the uh, crossroads there, which made it very easy to get people there and to have trade and all that type of stuff. And so uh, there was also, though, um, a man named Cicero, a story that he wrote and said that it was a land of most learned men in uh, liberal studies. And they were all, this, this was the way that they thought. They began to change the way they thought. So they were very uh, liberal in their thinking. As a matter of fact, uh, there was also a man that said this, uh, a guy named Juvenal. He was a Roman writer said that the river spilled its garbage into the Tiber, which basically meant this, that Antioch spilled its garbage into the river to corrupt Rome. In other words, Antioch had a direct influence on Rome, on how good or how bad it was. And unfortunately, it was garbage. Most of it made Rome worse. So if you can get in your mind how maybe you've heard how bad Rome was, that was maybe mild compared to what Antioch was. It Antioch was gross. It was it was a, a place that was had people who were given over to their own pleasures at most all the time. Uh, they worshiped different goddesses and gods. And, and one in particular was the goddess Daphne, who was supposed to be the lover of Apollo. And they built a garden that was so big, it, it covered probably a 10 mile in circumference. And it was populated by, uh, I mean, ladies and, and men who were basically prostitutes that basically were there to, you could take and uh, basically, I don't know how else to put this, but you could go in there and, and have uh, all the immorality that you wanted to have and call it worshiping of your God. And so, I mean, they had things like that there. They had uh, hired all sorts of magicians, astrologers, and they, they begin to live in mysticism. And, and so what we begin to see is that in the middle of all of this place where there's a bunch of corruption, there's a bunch of, in the government, there's a, a people giving over to their own flesh, sexual immorality, and calling it worship, the, 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 the destruction of what worship truly is. Now, I just want you to think about this. That was the view of worship that they had. People, if you grew up in Antioch, you grew up with this mindset that the, that worship was kind of whatever you wanted it to be, whatever it means to you. And and it could be even self-indulging if you want it to be. You could uh, give into mysticism here. You can give into the gods here. You can give into this little bit here. You just kind of mix it all together. And whatever you come up with is your own way to worship. And so in a place that is like this, that is corrupt, that's just gross, it's completely immoral, it, it, it's, a, it's a wicked city. It seems a very unlikely place to plant a church. 
But that's exactly what happens here. These men go to this city and instead of just looking around and go, wow, this is a wicked place, let's get out of here. They say, this place needs somebody to share the message of Jesus. This place is, is a great place to start a church because there are people here that need Jesus, that need salvation. And so there came a point uh, that as they were there, they were began to preach. But where they had been preaching only to the Jews, they did not see these Grecians, these Gentiles, and they began to preach the message of Jesus. And it says already in the, the Word of God here, it says that whenever they went preaching the Lord Jesus, that the hand, in verse number 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. In other words, God had already, uh, whether it was through their uh, talents, more likely what I believe it was through the Holy Spirit's empowerment upon their life, that they were being effective. They were sharing the message of Jesus. And it says in verse number 21, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now, this is what's amazing is that when all this begins to happen, the word makes it back to uh, to Jerusalem that people in, in Greece, are, are, are excuse me, in Antioch, these Grecians are being saved. Well, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's crazy. We've never heard of such a thing. So what they do, is they decide that, well, we're going to send a man, a person, to go and search these things out to see what is really going on. So they send a man named, that we've already been introduced to in the book of Acts, named Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who's sent to go to Antioch to see what exactly is going on and and see if it's really something that is happening. So this J- Jerusalem is this church, and, and so they're hearing stories about Peter. They're hearing stories about Antioch. And now, now Barnabas is going to go check this out. Peter's going to give me an account on this, but you go check this out in Antioch. And so as he goes, we see that he, he begins to see what's happening there. But boy, did they send the right person. They send the right kind of person. Barnabas is somebody we've already uh, came in contact with in the book of Acts. And when we see him in the book of Acts, what we see him doing is he's a selfless servant. He, he sees people who are hurting and, and maybe losing jobs, losing money, losing homes, losing family members, loved ones. And it came to a point where he had a portion of land and he sold it and he gave all of it to the church to be used just to serve people. We've also seen that whenever Paul or Saul at the time, whenever Saul uh, was actually consenting to the death of Stephen, and, and then Jesus shows up on the Damascus Road, he gets saved. Uh, one of the first people to take outside of, of um, you know, the guy that goes in, um, goodness sakes, uh, Acts chapter number 9, uh, and Ananias, there we go, As besides him coming in to actually uh, take him and baptize him and things like that, the one of the first people to take him in is a man named Barnabas, this man right here. He, he deals with this guy who's been on the outcast, no one trusts him, and yet Barnabas just is kindred and heart, and he says, listen, come with me, and, and I will begin to work with you and mentor you and love on you and, and show you the things of God, and, and I want you to come with me. So we are see his heart his passion for people and so they send this man and as he shows up there he begins to see what is going on now the one of the things that we see about him in the description is what kind of person Barnabas was and it says that Barnabas when he shows up there it begins to give a description it says that he was a man that he was a good man and you could say that he was a righteous man a man full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and really, that's what you see is a great description of a, a, a willing servant of God, a good godly Christian, is really summarized in these three things. That he was a righteous man. That he was a man who was full of faith. That he was a man who was led by the Holy Spirit in his life. And if you think about it, that is exactly what each of us, you and I, need for our lives as well. To be people who are classified, defined by our, uh, by people and, and, and on ourselves. That we are living and striving to live a righteous life. 
to be right with God. That means being obedient to, to know what the Word of God says and to do what the Word of God says, but also to, to understand that, that to be righteous is to have a relationship with God, to, to know that my, my faith is more than just knowledge, but to, to put it into action, that to live by uh, this way of righteousness. And we already have a right standing through salvation with God, but to, to pursue to become more like His Son, Jesus, to, to live that righteous life. But then He says that He may have a full of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's led by the Holy Spirit. He's, where the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, but be full of the Holy Ghost. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Be, be led by it so much that whenever you, you know that you're being pushed away towards the edge of sin, he, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you back. And he says, just let the Holy Spirit guide and direct your life. And that you're full of faith. That you're, that your way that you live your life is classified by, I, I'm living by faith. That, that I, I follow God. It sometimes doesn't make sense, but I live my life by faith. That was how this man was described. He was also one who was an encourager. Uh, all throughout the Word of God, as you look at the name Barnabas, son of consolation, he is an encourager. He's somebody who tries to find a person where they are and lift their spirits up. And so this is a man who, who's coming here and as he comes, he's coming with a purpose to, to really discern what's going on with an open heart. But he's also coming for the purpose of making sure what is really happening is of God. So he, he, he's able to take two difficult things, truth and love, and bring them together. He's not going to compromise the truth. He's going to make sure that things are going right in, in Antioch, that people are truly being saved. But he's going to love them if they are, because where they are, is probably coming out of the debauchery that we've talked about. It's already in, uh, in Antioch. Maybe not all, but some. And he's going to take the truth. He's not going to compromise that. But he also is not going to not love them. So he's going to take the two together. And he's going to love them and combine it with the truth of God. And he, he was very good at that. A righteous man, full of the Holy Spirit, that lived by faith and was a simple encourager. So when he shows up, he finds a group of believers, the starting of a church, and here are some things that he finds out. And this is where we get to the actual points. What does Barnabas find when he actually gets to Antioch? And the first thing he sees is, is great grace. He sees great grace. And when he sees this, he sees the spreading of the story of Jesus, the great grace, and then also the receiving of the message of Jesus, which is great grace. So basically, he sees the spreading of the Word of God and the receiving of the Word of God, which is really the great grace that God has given. So what we see here is that the hand of the Lord had already been upon these people, and they had turned unto the Lord. Now, there's something about that that needs to be really focused in on, because what we saw is these people would serve the, these gods over here, and then they would serve uh, the mysticist gods over here. They would serve over here, and they would, they would just kind of gather a group of gods, and they would worship them just in case they were wrong, and one, they had another to back them up. So when it says that they turned to the Lord, they had left all that behind and turned solely to follow Christ. I remember uh, speaking with a missionary in India, and he, he said this. He said, listen, one of the hardest things to do in India is to get people to understand they're not adding Jesus to their list of gods. They are turning their back on all other gods to serve the one and true God. And that's exactly probably what they were trying to, to get them to understand. Here are these people. They're turning to Christ. They're being saved. But they're turning their back on that old way of living. And really, that's what salvation is. Salvation is a new heart, a new mind, a new life. I'm turning my back on the way I used to live and the way I used to think. And I, because God's changed me on the inside, I'm going to be different now. And so it says they turn to the Lord. And it says that when Barnabas shows up, he says he comes in and he begins to notice, without much inspection it seems like, that there was a grace of God that was on their life. He sees the evidence of the grace of God. He's seeing people who are, are different, that are that are changed, that are people who are Gentiles, that, that they seem, I, I don't see anything about these people here that are different than me. They're saved people by the grace of God. They are sinners, just like you and I. They're sinners, but they're saved. Now here's an amazing thing. God has already set the foundation in chapter 10. 
that the message of the of salvation is not just for Jews, it's for Samaritans, and it's for Gentiles. And here we see the story of Gentiles being saved because some Jews really stretched across the boundaries to see a city that was corrupted by sin, but said, I don't see a city corrupted by sin. I see sinners who need say, a Savior that needs salvation. <clears throat> they went in there against the grain and began to share the gospel. And people, because the hand of God was upon them, were saved. Now, th this is the amazing thought that I had. Not that my thoughts are amazing, but the, the thought that I, I was thinking that I thought was amazing is that instead of looking at that city as a lost cause, they saw it as a ripe opportunity. And, and it sounds a little bit like what Jesus said. Look, the fields are wide on the harvest. The only thing we're lacking are the laborers. And as you see, as they came preaching, and they came with the heart to serve and to love and to give themselves what we see is that grace began to take over. People who maybe were ashamed of their past, people who had a past that was that was addictive and and, and uh, divisive and it corrupted the family, it corrupted the mind, it corrupted the heart. And yet these people, somebody was searching for answers, and people started to be saved, and God started changing their life. You know, the story of salvation is not different today. God's still looking for people who are who are stained by sin, whether it's because of the debauchery of a lifestyle or whether it's because the fact is that you're, you're a sinner. We are all born sinners. And Jesus says that I sent my son to die on the cross for you, that you may experience grace. You can't earn salvation. You can't, you can't do anything to earn that part. The only thing you can do is receive the free gift of Jesus which is salvation by grace through faith. That's it. That's what Jesus has laid out for us as, as how, how do I know that I'm saved? I've received the gift of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and raised to give up the third day. And I confess with my, la my, my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in my heart the Bible says I will be saved. And here's what happens. These people were receiving grace and then spreading grace. Hey, I, I'm going to receive this message, but then I'm supposed to be a spreader of the message. Now, I know the idea of spreader in this day and age of super spreader events and yada, yada, yada has really taken a toll on our society. But really, we're supposed to be spreaders, not of germs, but of love of God. And so it says that when Barnabas shows up, he sees the grace of God. And here was his response. He was ecstatic. He was glad. It said he was glad in what he saw. He was overwhelmed that he saw these people who were saved and they, they, their lives have become different and it made them happy. I tell you, every person that we come in contact with that has, has maybe been saved recently, but there should be something in our hearts that we're glad that, man, God's still saving people. That kid on the van route, he got saved. Man, that is amazing. God's still saving kids. That, that older person that has been away from God for all those years got saved. Man, that is amazing. God is still saving people. And you know, the, that is a true reality that we, all of us need to remember is that God still saves. And so he sees great grace in the church. He sees the spreading of grace and the receiving of grace. The second thing that he sees, though, is a desire to grow in their faith. A desire to grow in their faith. Now, notice the first thing that Barnabas does is he comes there. He probably already knows just from the from where he's ministered before is that when you are saved, you get excited about some things. Oh man, I'm, I'm changing my life. And, and, and yet he knows this. If they stay in Antioch, that 10 mile radius of that worshiping of that goddess is still going to be there. All those places that they used to go, they're still going to be there. All, all those, I guess you could say, the calling back to that old lifestyle, they are still going to be there. And because they're still going to be there, there's going to be this dynamic pull to go back to the way you used to live. And Barnabas knows this. And so one of the first things that he does, after he's seen the grace... He's excited about what he sees. He says this, 
I exhort you, I'm challenging you that with purpose of heart, with purpose of heart, that you would cleave to the Lord. Now, what is he saying there? He's saying, my first instruction to you, I see, hey, your salvation squared away. But the one thing that I really want to challenge you with is grab a hold of Jesus and never let go. Cleave unto him as if your life depends upon it. Don't turn your back on him. Don't let go of him. Hold on to him tight. Why? Because he knows that the deeper you fall in love with Christ, the more you find out about Christ, the more you hold on, you're cleaving to him, the more likely it is that you will not turn away from him. The idea of cleaving here is, is this idea of what even Joshua would say. He said cleave to the Lord, but the idea of even cleaving to a, a knife and holding on to it so tight that when you're in battle, you won't let go of that because that is really what you depend upon for your livelihood. It, it's your attack. It's your defense. It's everything you need for the fight. And so he says cleave on to it is the most important thing. Do not let it go. You let it go. You're defenseless. When you begin to turn your back on it, you become defenseless. So he says, cleave, hold on to it. He also says with a purpose of heart. In other words, make it a, make it a priority in your life. Now, here's, a, here's something that we really need to address is that, boy, we have a lot of priorities in life right now. Um, one thing that I know that a priority can happen to us is in a day and age like this is that we make politics a priority. We make, uh, uh, maybe it is right now, health and wellness our priority because of the new year. Maybe it, there's just so many different things that you can make a priority in your life. Maybe it's a family. And I think all those things are good in and of themselves. But can I just really encourage you, make Christ, the sole purpose of your heart to cleave to him. And then once that is part of your life, that's when everything else will fall into place. Put God first. The family stuff will come, will uh, figure itself out. Family it will be better when you put God first. Your, your job will be better when you put God first. Everything is better when you put God first. Cleave to God first and foremost, then focus on those other things. I, I've been challenged this year by uh, something that I, I heard, and that is that there's a lot of good books out there to read. But the main book that you need to read and spend time in is the Word of God. And there, there's been times where I've put a priority on reading other books and then reading the Bible, you know, kind of when I get done reading it. I, I'm trying to make a priority switch in my life that I'll put the Word of God first this year. And I, I will read it before I read anything else. And, and maybe this year you need to, before you get on Facebook, before you check your emails, put God first in your life. Spend time praying. Spend time reading His Word. It doesn't have to be hours long. But do something to, to strengthen your cleaving, your holding on to the Word of God. The idea of cleaving there also is that you leave your father and mother, where Genesis says, leave your father and mother. And I just read this just the other day in my Bible reading. You leave your father and mother and you cleave to the, become one flesh and you cleave to your husband. Uh, and and that, that's really the idea is that you leave, you turn your back on, you leave that way of living and you grab onto and commit yourself to something different. And that is Jesus Christ. So he says, I want you to do that. Here's the thing, though. They received that message. They had that desire to grow. And one of the ways that we see that, it says that, it says he purposed in their heart to do that. And there came a point where he says, hey, listen, they're really doing this. I need help. We, we get, we're seeing so many people saved. We need help preaching and teaching and discipling that I need someone to help me out. And he goes and he's to Tarshish and he seeks out Saul. He says, I want to bring Saul to Antioch to help with this ministry. And so he goes and he finds Saul. And it says they stay there an entire year as they assemble themselves with the church. And they taught the people. And here's what happens. Because they have this desire to grow, the outside world gave them a name. The outside world began to learn about who they were. They were still people from Antioch. They were still uh, people who lived there, dwelt there, but there was something different about them. And it was noticeable in town. Maybe it's because they stopped going to certain places and started going to church. And maybe they stopped reading the liberal theology that was of the mindset that they were talking about then that was corrupting the minds of the people. But they started reading the, the Word of God. Maybe it is that they, they went down a different pathway that people started noticing a change. And when they said, what is, what's going on? And they would say, you know, my life is different because I've given my life to Christ, to Jesus, the, the Savior. 
and I've given, I've switched from, I've been saved. And they said, well, who is this Christ? And as they would tell about, about Jesus. And eventually, they got a mark. They got a name. They got an identity that was not one they came up with, but that was given to them by the people at Antioch. And they called them Christians. <laughs> they called them Christians because of the way that they would live their desire to grow, the way they lived their daily life. It changed them so much that the, the people of Antioch said, this Christ, this, this, these people, they act like this Christ that they talk about. We're going to call them Christ followers, Christians. They're, they're people who are different. They are somebody who is actually living like this person, Christ, or what they would even say, Christ imitators. Christians. And the name stuck. I think it should be classified of each of us that are recipients of the great grace of God that you and I have a desire to grow in our faith. And that as we have a desire to grow to our faith, that we cleave to the Lord, that we grow, but also this, that our life is changed dramatically by that, so much so people can say, that is a Christian. There's something about that guy that is an imitator of Christ. He, he, his likeness is that of Christ. That, that There's something different about that woman, the way she acts, the way she talks, the way she, she interacts with her family. The way, there's just something about them. It doesn't have to be a Facebook post that says, I'm a Christian. It doesn't have to be a everybody getting out there and just demanding that, hey, call me a Christian because I am. No, no. There was something about these people's lives that just, it, it, it was a testimony of their actions that said they were a Christian. I wonder if that could be said about you and I today. That people look at us and say, that's a Christian. The next thing we see is that after they have received a great grace, they're spreading the word of God, receiving the word of God, receivers and spreaders, receivers and spreaders. They have the desire to grow, to come closer to God. We see that it does make a change. And what we see next is their love in action. Now, what happens is they continue to show the love of God by continuing to share the gospel. And we'd even see in chapter number 13, in just a uh, few messages, that in chapter number 13, really the, they send out the best people of their church, Paul and Barnabas. They send them out of the church of Antioch to go spread the gospel further praying for them, uh, investing into them. These people loved sinners and wanted to see them saved. It, it, there is something about them that, that you just see that is all over their, their life. That they In chapter 13, they are praying for the, the people to go out to, to, to be effective in the preaching of the gospel, to go out to spread the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and that sinners would be saved in places like Rome, in places uh, like Alexandria. All these places that are associated with them, they, they want Paul and, and, and they want uh, Barnabas, uh, they want them to be effective to see people saved. They love people. They understood that the worst of them could be saved. They understood that if Saul could be saved, or if they who spent time in that 10-acre ranch, or those who spent time in the, the, the places of, of absolute wickedness in that place of Antioch, if those people could be saved, anybody could be saved. Jew, Gentile, Samaritan, Ethiopian, it doesn't matter. God is wanting to change lives. And so they put that love into action. And they begin to pray. It says that they prayed and they separated Barnabas and Saul out for the work. It says that they, they gave. They did whatever it was necessary. They laid their hands on them. They fasted. They prayed for their labors. They prayed for them to be sent away and that God would use them. Their love was put into action that they got behind these men financially. They got behind them in prayer and fasting that God would use them to change people's lives. They loved people because God loved them. They also loved the brethren because at the end of chapter number 11, there came a, a prophecy uh, by one named Agabus that there would be a, a dearth or a drought, a famine throughout the world, which came uh, to pass, it says, when time of uh, Claudius Caesar. It says then the disciples, it says that the, in Jerusalem is where they're going to need some relief. And so the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. What they did is they saw 
there were some brothers in need. And we're financially going to give as much as what we can. It says everybody gave. Maybe not the same amount. Maybe there's somebody there who has had a little bit more money that gave $500. But there was somebody there that was struggling with bills, gave $10. It didn't matter how much you gave. It was the fact that the heart behind the issue was they gave. And, and really there's something here to be said is that when Christ changes us, when we become great recipients of the great grace of God, and whenever we have a desire to grow to cleave to the Lord, it should be expressed outwardly on how we view the lost and how we view our brothers and sisters in Christ who may be struggling. In other words, God says, hey, you can have all these great talents, but if you don't have love, you're just a bunch of noise. We need to show forth the love of God, the love, of act, the love in action, their faith in action. All of this is put to where we can challenge ourselves with this thought. You know, am I really just a Christian in name or does there is there action to back it up? Do I care if people are receiving the word of God? Do I care if people come to know Jesus Christ as their savior? Do I give? Do I pray for those things? Do, do I put that as a priority in my life? And do I see others in need and try to help out however I can, whether it's financially or not? Listen, I, I'm, I'm on, we're in the auditorium here and I'm looking back over here to my left. And back there is our missions board. And a matter of fact, I was just reading uh, just the other day. Uh, I just have a couple letters here and reading uh, missionary letters that we're going to read this morning uh, from the Barlow family. A uh, family there whose uh, coronavirus has really uh, hit hard there in that area. And, and, and you know, we're, we're reading these letters. And, and one of the things Monty Barlow is saying, I just, we want more of an opportunity to share the gospel because people are dying and we want to share the gospel with them. Reading other letters from missionaries who are in China about how people are, who are being saved and having opportunities to witness to uh, Chinese Muslim people and, and actually having them in their house and sharing the, the message of Jesus and the people who are involved with the Communist Party and, and who have been opposed to Jesus. Just reading stories like that or how that brother David Ray had just two people saved, I think it was last, uh, last Sunday at their church service. And just the wonderful things that have been happening. And, and, and I just, I think about how we need to pray fast, give to things like that, because more people are being saved. We, we need to pray fast and give right here in our own church so people can be saved. You know, I think when we look at this story is that we see that there are three basic things that each of us as individuals who make up the church need to have. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you experienced that great grace? And if you have, are you a spreader of that grace? And do you share that grace with other people? Do you have a desire to know God more? Do you have a desire to grow? Do you want to cleave to the Lord with all that you have and put him as a priority in your life? And then, and then lastly to this, do you put your faith or your love that God has placed within you in action? Do people see it by your actions? How you treat the mindset of lost people? Uh, do, do you have a mind and a heart to see people saved? Do, do you give? Do you pray? Do you fast? Do you, do you, do you put God's work first? Listen, here, here's one thing that we see the Bible does say. It says you can invest your life on things here below, but there's going to come a day this whole world's going to be passed away. You're going to die, and there's going to be a time you can't take with you when you go. Invest it into heavenly things where rust and moss, they can't corrupt those things. But boy, up there, God remembers it. So invest in those things that which are eternal. God can use a few people to make a big difference in an anti-God culture. And I believe that you and I are finding ourselves becoming more and more into an anti-God culture. And that if that is the case, God can use you. God can use me. He wants to use you to be effective. It's only going to start by you strengthening your faith, being involved in your local church, giving, praying, fasting, and then being someone who puts a priority on spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Something I've been challenged about, something that is hard for me at times to do, but you and I need to be challenged by this in our heart. Who is it that we're going to share the gospel with this week? Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you have a great week. And for all those of you that are part of our Calvary family, be praying for each other. We love you very much. We miss you. And we cannot wait till you are able to be back here. And it looks like that from here on out, 
uh, we should be having uh, videos. We've got a, a phone fixed up now to where we can have videos up until the time we get our live stream going. So be praying for that. Sorry that it was a little long this morning for you that are online. I wanted to recap everything from chapter number 10 to be able to understand those things which were 11. And so if you're watching this and go, man, that was a long one, Brad. I promise next week I'll try to do shorter, okay? Thank you so much. Love you guys. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. I want to pray for you and pray for this morning's service. And I hope that God blesses your life today and encourages you. And I just keep praying for our country. Keep praying for our church members. And continue to pray for those who have lost family members lately and uh, who have been struggling. So we just need to be praying for each other, okay? God, thank you for the day that you've given to us. Lord, I ask that you bless those that watch this morning. And God, I do ask that you would, uh, Lord, help them as they're uh, working towards getting back here, that things will go smoothly. And God, I just thank you for the opportunity that we had to be able to have a phone now to where we're able to record this morning and get the message out there. Lord, I ask that as we get the live stream stuff coming in soon, that you'd help us to uh, have that working for our church family and then for those that continue to watch. God, thank you for the uh, all those that continue to already do what we've practiced or looked at here today in their practice of giving, serving, loving, uh, telling about you. Lord, I just ask that more of us would be uh, better at doing this, and that we could be see the effectiveness of this church at Antioch, that we would strive to be those type of Christians as well. Lord, we love you, and we ask that you would be with each person that uh, right now is not able to be here, and also for those that have lost loved ones lately, that have been struggling with health issues, maybe financial issues because of uh, loss of jobs. Uh, God, I just ask that you would uh, help them to continue to to be dedicated to you, to love you, and to put you first, first in their life, and that, Lord, that you bless them for that. Lord, we ask that you would uh, once again bless this morning's service. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next week.